Baik, selamat pagi uh, teman-teman semua, mahasiswa dan juga baik yang dari, dari UGM maupun dari luar UGM dan juga tamu undangan yang lain. Uh, sebelum kita mulai kuliah pada pagi hari ini, uh, saya akan mengucapkan terima kasih mengucapkan terima kasih karena teman-teman sudah meluangkan waktunya untuk bergabung di kuliah umum ini. Uh, saya hanya ingin mengingatkan uh, ada beberapa hal yang mungkin bisa menjadi concern atau perhatian teman-teman semua. Uh, pertama, selama perkuliahan saya minta teman-teman untuk tidak mengaktifkan mikrofon uh, dan tapi uh, kami sarankan untuk mengaktifkan uh, kamera, video kamera jika memungkinkan. Uh, untuk selanjutnya, jika teman-teman ingin bertanya setelah presentasi selesai teman-teman bisa menyampaikan pada chat box atau nanti akan diberi kesempatan oleh Bu Sari dan Mas Garensa di sini yang akan mendampingi uh, saya menjadi host di pagi hari ini uh, siang hari ini maksud saya dan nanti teman-teman bisa raise hand dulu supaya kami bisa memberi kesempatan pada teman-teman untuk membuka mikrofon dan juga menyampaikan pertanyaan langsung ke Profesor Barbara baik Uh, di chatroom sudah ada uh, link yang disampaikan oleh Bu Sari uh, mengenai materi kuliah yang teman-teman bisa download uh, sambil mengikuti perkuliahan disampaikan oleh Prof. Barbara dan juga ada uh, uh, virtual background. So, um, yep, nanti sebelum dimulai kita akan membuka kamera bersama untuk mengambil gambar sebagai uh, bukti dokumentasi dari kegiatan ini. Oke, okay, uh, baik Mas sebelum kita mulai mungkin kita di setting saja uh, untuk mengambil gambar ya. Jadi kita formal informalnya sekarang untuk mengambil gambar. Teman-teman saya minta semua di open kameranya dan menggunakan fitur background yang ada. So, yep, Professor Barbara, we still uh, uh, try to uh, consolidate uh, the this lecture today i just um, uh, share with the student rules today and we plan to, uh, and now we want to take our uh, cap like capture our screen so the student uh, and their face and their feature background can be documented uh, as a proof of our uh, public lecture today thank you thank you all right You tell me when to start, please. Yes, I will. Uh, I will let you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, studio, apakah ready untuk capture uh, capture gambar? Okay, teman-teman yang lain. Okay, uh, student and also invitation uh, in, uh, and guests. Uh, please open your camera because uh, the operator will capture our screen. Uh, to document the public lecture uh, today. Make sure that you smile and open the camera. Obviously, we're still waiting for uh, the student uh, to open the camera so you're able to see their face. <laughs> I'm, I'm able, I see. All right, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, go. Okay, yang lain masih ditunggu? Okay, for the student for UGM, I just want to let you know uh, you have to, uh, you have to make sure that you already uh, scan the QR code for the uh, the present uh, the present system. So I'm not sure whether it's already uh, setting up, and just let me know if you have a problem in uh, scanning that QR code for attendance proof. All right. Okay. I think it's all captured. Mas Yedi? Okay. Then. All right. Okay. So, uh, all right. I will start the meeting and the lecture now. All right. Uh, good morning, uh, student, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the public lecture of uh, remote sensing for hydrology and catchment management, a course offered annually in the Department of Geographic Information System. Information Science, I mean, not system, in the Faculty of Geography, Universitas Gajah Mada. Is it, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome and introduce our speaker today, who is going uh, to talk to us about the flooding hazard assessment considering climate change in the coastal area of Indonesia based on remote sensing and GIS data. Um, our speaker also will share 
her expertise in data mining based on uh, free available data and software as a contribution to hazard preparedness in affected community. Uh, this subject is important at uh, this course because we should all be deeply interested because it's by knowing the connectivity of inter element and the comprehensive and environment analysis uh, is very important and needed to make sure the sustainability of our water and land, especially in Indonesia, who face um, very intensive degradation, especially related to the catchment area and also its management. So our speaker today is uh, a professor, an expert in uh, sustainable water resources, and also there are many research that related with tsunami. Currently, he's uh, she's active in a tsunami research or study in Nigeria. And she has been uh, practicing and also uh, mastering a lot in remote sensing analysis. Uh, she is a um, professor in Institute of Applied Geoscience, is uh, retired, but her knowledge is not retired, I believe so. So, and it is also very active in reviewing uh, some uh, high level uh, paper journal. One of them is Sustainable Water Resource Management, a journal with uh, Springer Nature, a publisher. So uh, without uh, further ado, uh, students and ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Barbara Chelan Willigate. Professor. Thank you very much. So we start. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I thank again very much for being invited. And uh, it's a great honor for me to uh, lecture today and to be a participant as well. So uh, we start the presentation. Wait a minute, I have to look to get the right button here. So thank you. Yes. So, yeah, now we have it. Uh, I hope you can see. Um, you have seen this uh, screenshot already. We are, I give you a short presentation. Sorry. sorry. Uh, I will you give, I give to you a short overview what to expect during this lecture. I will give a short introduction um, and then uh, an overview of the research problems and the goals. Then about the methods, uh, I think it's important to know uh, more about data collection uh, when we are dealing with uh, uh, creating a data bank. Then I give a short overview of uh, the about the open software. I think many of you know already. And then I show some results of the, my, my research uh, and other research. And finally, we come to the conclusion. So uh, let's start. Um, I think great tasks are awaiting Indonesia. Adaption to climate change um, has to adopt a system of interdisciplinary approach. And uh, this is uh, including critical infrastructure, land use, uh, water management and, this, and so on. And um, I think uh, climate change and rapid urbanization will expose more and more population in Indonesia to flooding hazards. And future informal urbanization activities in dangerous terrain will increase vulnerabilities, not only for flooding, but also for landslides or soil erosion in the fast growing regions. Urban and rural settlements will also face increased risks, such as the intensification of storms and cyclones. So therefore, developing integrated risk reduction strategies in such regions will become one of the great challenges of the future, not only for Indonesia. So um, what you see um, when you look at the main natural hazards in Indonesia, uh, flash floods, tsunami waves, um, then uh, you see immediately among the natural hazards affecting Indonesia, flooding is the most frequent one. And uh, the occurrence of extreme meteorological events uh, because of climate change um, will increase. 
So uh, global climate change will result in increased surface temperature, increased rainfall intensity, rising sea level and extreme weather uh, patterns. And there are, of course, different models uh, concerning sea level rise. But what I want to focus on is that we can expect a sea level rise um, that are estimating up to 2.4 meters in 2000 in our century, end of our century, and up to 15 meter in 2300. And here comes the point where we have to ask ourselves as a scientist, what do we do with this um, calculation? Because um, 15 meter is a, yeah, it's a challenge. Um, I think there will be sea level rise, maybe in the middle, maybe five meter, maybe 10 meter, but uh, we don't know yet. So um, I think, um, a worst case scenario of 15 meter might be possible because what we see here, you see some of the reasons of sea level rise. I think you treat these uh, themes in your lectures as well. Uh, one of the biggest issues is the uh, temperature rising and the, then the polar ice sheets are melting and uh, then the loss of glaciers. So what we know is now, uh, and even the experts dealing with climate modeling, they are surprised how fast this development is uh, now becoming. And uh, fact is that the melting of the polar, polar ice sheets happens faster than expected so far. Uh, inclusive, the thermal thawing, uh, the uh, thawing of permafrost uh, soils in the northern part of our Earth becomes uh, more intense and more faster than expected. The global burning of um, uh, forests, uh, rainforests, and setting free a lot of carbon dioxide and uh, so on. This happens with an intensity, uh, even experts are surprised now about the consequences. And now we really have to think about whether the a 15 meter sea level rise, we cannot exclu exclude that it might be possible. So I think we must deal, um, because we have to be responsible for the future for Indonesia as well, uh, that there might be 15 meter above sea level. We cannot exclude this 15 meters. So what would this mean for Indonesia? Look at this map above. What the, 15 meters above sea level mean, for example, for Java, I think uh, nearly a quarter of Java will be flooded in the worst case scenario. On the other side, the, you have your problem with the increasing population. So uh, I think it's a real challenge for Indonesia. So what I want to show with this uh, slide is that we have not to depend on uh, estimations or assumptions. We have satellites telling us exactly um, the sea level rise data. But our problem is uh, you have your data as well in Indonesia measuring the sea level in the different harbors, for example. There are exact precise measurements, but we have to see in the future, into the future. And this is the problem. Uh, what to do? We have to think ahead. And this is our responsibility as scientists. The, uh, another problem is the subsidence problem. For example, in Zimarang or in Jakarta, you have know this very well. So this comes together, the subsidence movements in the northern part of Java, for example, and sea level rise. So the problem is uh, worse, I, we can see. We can see this development already just by comparing the oldest satellite imageries on the left uh, top, you see on, on the left side, you, you see some Landsat scenes from 1972, the earliest available Landsat images. And when you compare this uh, with the situation, for example, in 2018, you see the land loss. This is the line from the coastal line from 1972. And you see in comparison already 
um, this is a picture from the dry season, not the wet season. So there is land loss already uh, notable. Of course, you have to monitor carefully um, when dealing with climate change, uh, the dry season and the flooding season to see the extent of flooding, um, whether there are differences, uh, whether uh, there is a possibility that already more area is flooded due to climate change. And for this, we need remote sensing to have a good database, a reliable uh, database to uh, provide information for administration, for local communities and so on. So we see that already now areas below 10 meter height level are flooded regularly, for example, in the Semarang area. So I think this uh, we can imagine what might happen in the future. So what I said already, flooding risk management is a typical multidisciplinary task requiring many types of data with special and temporal attributes uh, that should be made available to local authorities for decision making or to do in the future. And experts from different disciplines have to close to work together in order to transfer this knowledge to the affected communities and cities. But hence, there's often still a gap between scientific development, I think you have the experience as well, and the knowledge transfer. Cities and settlements and the communities yeah, far away from larger universities, for example, are often not provided with enough equipment and highly trained personnel and to, are not able to use these data that are available today. And my goal today is to demonstrate that the data and software free of charge could be used now for everybody with access to internet and a laptop and to contribute to a database for this purpose, purpose provided that there is enough effort to train the stuff and uh, to give the knowledge. And uh, when I think back in, when I was young, I had a uh, young girl, I had to buy one Lancet scene for 600 uh, US dollar. And uh, the software was uh, to process this data was several thousand euro. Now we have free software. So it's a, just a question of knowledge transfer and training. Uh, and so uh, what is important to do with this uh, remote sensing data is that the communities are able to identify flood prone areas and to establish suitable flood mitigation and emergency strategies to avoid economic loss and livelihood. So um, this is something uh, I think uh, we are yeah, obliged to contribute to. So uh, what I said, many environmental data are free available in the web, as well as the necessary software. So disaster resilience is nowadays mainly a question of knowledge transfer and training of staff uh, with the focus, not for scientific purpose, but just to focus on how to handle, process and deliver the data to the affected communities or to the people. And to combine this knowledge with the tra traditional knowledge of the people, this is, I think, a very important thing because in Indonesia, you, you have already the knowledge, enough knowledge. Thus, hazard preparedness depends on the training and knowledge of the responsible staff, such, for example, in the fire brigades or the police. And the first step is the creation of the data bank and continuously data mining in a geo-information system. And this is one of the prerequisites for disaster resilience in the hazard-prone cities and settlements. Every community could use the open source data and tools to adapt their strategies to their local conditions and strengthen their resilience. With the adapted know-how, it is possible to create a GIS integrated database for every local authorities. So I will give some examples from Zorabaya and uh, from Zemarang, you have seen already. 
So I come to the needs um, we can, I want to present. First, we create a basic data bank. We start with data mining of different geo data and inclusive social data or economic data. Then we integrate different satellite data further on the actual meteorological and hydrological data, and then land use, land use data from agriculture, from forestry, and so on. And all this layer we integrate uh, into uh, GIS. A lot of work has been done already in Indonesia, excellent work. But as, have, as I've mentioned already, um, I don't believe that many uh, far commun smaller communities have access to the knowledge of this and how to use this data. So I think it's a major task to fulfill for all the students, for example, that are participating in this uh, science. So where to get the data uh, without costs and to be able very quickly to get the data infrastructure ready in a geo database. First of all, where I go first when I look for uh, road information for railroads, for example, then uh, I go to this website and download the so called shape files for the GIS, the including roads, buildings, and all the information. And even if the area of interest you are working in is not covered by this data, you can use the data infrastructure to continue with and digitize yourself. And you can contribute later to the open source community to give your data then to others. Here you can find as well administration data or here country data, they are a little bit older, but still there are a lot of free available data that, that you don't need to start from the beginning with a digitizing process. So where to get the satellite data? As I've mentioned already, we have Landsat data since 272. So um, yourself by experience is the cloud cover. So uh, it's a great uh, advantage now that these Sentinel-1 satellite ray data, radar data are free of charge and can be downloaded from every part of the world free of charge. And this is extremely important for the seasonal monitoring to see which areas are flooded during the dry season or during a cyclone, for example, during Cyclone Dahlia, um, and uh, which areas are precisely uh, prone to flooding uh, what we cannot see on optical data because of the cloud cover. So just to show you where to collect the, the satellite data, uh, that is, for example, from NASA. Uh, you can, uh, there are good uh, handbooks how to use these sites. And then, uh, for example, from ESA, there are now programs to get high resolution satellite images free of charge if you register. This might be interesting for the students to get, uh, for example, satellite data with three meter resolution and below free of charge if you apply for uh, on this web website for it. But the most uh, common site to search satellite data and easy to use and quickly to use uh, this is this first site I visit when I'm looking at uh, or searching for satellite data is the US Geological Survey. And uh, then it's worth to register here and download the data, whether you want Landsat data or Sentinel-2 data, whatever digital terrain data you can find here on every area of the world. Just to show you now the satellites from the Sentinel mission, they have a polar orbit and are surrounding the Earth. And uh, you can download now from ESA all these Sentinel-1 satellite radar images from every season, uh, free of charge. But a warning, it's more than one gigabyte for one scene. So it's uh, you need uh, a good storage capac capacity for your laptop to work with this uh, data and uh, to uh, ex uh, process the data. Uh, and uh, for this reason, uh, just to show you we work uh, during this session more with satellite radar data, um, 
this is an uh, active uh, system that the set Sentinel-1 uh, satellites are emitting radar signals that are emitted by uh, the satellite and then reflected from the Earth surface. And what is important to know when you're dealing with radar data that water surfaces appear black on the satellite radar image because of the mirror-like reflection. And then uh, when you have a lot of vegetation, a forest, for example, there is a diffuse reflection of radar signals. And when you have buildings, there's a very strong reflection and these um, uh, parts appear very in light gray tones on the radar image. But what we are interested in in this part of the radar image to monitor water surfaces. For example, here this scene from Kalimantan from the coal mining area, and then extract from the images the information of these water surfaces and uh, to combine this data, for example, with roads, with buildings and so on. So uh, what I wanted to, uh, what I have said already, we need digital image processing software. And as I mentioned before, have mentioned before, uh, uh, the professional um, processing software, for example, as Envy, you pay many thousand euros, euros to pay for this software. It's excellent, it's the best, but who can afford this amount of um, money for the software? Now we have a very good software provided from the European Space Agent Agency, ESA, you can download here, I have the uh, address here, and there are very good tutorials as well. So uh, it's worthwhile to, worth to learn how to proceed and to work with this data. If you like, after this presentation, we can um, make a short session, a first introduction, how to manage and to make a digital in image processing of optical data, of Sentinel-2 data, and how to manage radar data uh, in this software. Meanwhile, uh, uh, it's very good to handle. For using free uh, GIS software, I think the open source uh, cool GIS is the best GIS software free of charge. Of course, I work a lot with ArcMap um, from ESRI. Um, for universities, you pay, um, I can say, because uh, I pay 100 euro a year to use the complete software. I think for universities, uh, it is uh, worth to uh, use this possibility because otherwise it's too expensive to buy this software. But of course, uh, ArcMap, um, ArcGIS allows um, more fluently workflow for me, for example. But open source is CoGIS and offers every day more opportunities, more tools, and I think it's worth to uh, train people in every community, if hopefully, uh, one day um, uh, to manage the basic functions of CoGIS to integrate shape files, for example, of roads, of buildings, uh, to give, for example, fire brigades or police or whoever is interested, civil engineers, uh, to work with this data. So this is free as of charge. Of course, uh, everybody knows already in Indonesia that there are a lot of web services and tools to integrate meteorological data, digital elevation data from Indonesia and so on. And uh, there is Sentinel Asia providing information of flooding and many kinds of information. Uh, I think you use it already and uh, as well for uh, uh, rainfall information for flooding information. There are a lot of web services you can use, but sometimes um, it's a little bit uh, overwhelming where to start, where to, if there's an emergency, the best thing you have a database ready to use and then immediately integrate the, the actual data. And then you can, if you have still time, you go to all these additional information systems. As well, another tool uh, where to get information, for example, about uh, water flux or surface one, or to give you an idea, you see um, 
just to see um, the amount of, pre of precipitation during the last years in the area of Surabaya has increased uh, very much and uh, with this, this surface on off. So uh, it is important in case uh, of uh, heavy precipitations to know exactly where are the most rain bearing clouds, how is the distribu distribution of the precipitations and to get an idea which areas uh, to give an alert uh, that there might be an emergency first. And these data you can download from here is uh, PIF files, integrate into your GIS and see immediately which areas are prone most to flooding, probably because of the heavy, heavy rains. So you see the uh, integration of a lot of data sets and train uh, the knowledge about the differences of which areas are prone to flooding, which areas not. This is very important. So what we have to do is uh, to use now the digital elevation data and the precipitation data and to, to, to derive areas prone to flooding due to the geomorphologic disposition. And then we use the satellite data from the past uh, to document exactly which areas have been flooded in the past uh, and their extent of flooding. And then we use the radar data again for documentation of past flooding events, but as well uh, for the documentation of actual flooded areas. So just to give you an example, what I've done in uh, the Surabaya area, I uh, calculated the geomorphological watershed uh, and the drainage basins. For those who are not familiar, familiar with the, what the meaning of geomorphological watershed, when there's rain and here's a hill ridge, um, then uh, the surface runoff is uh, divided. One part is moving to this side and to the other side. And you get a drainage basin just uh, uh, within the drainage. Um, here are the morphological watersheds and here you get a drainage basin. And this you can derive from calculations of the digital terrain or eleven elevation models in this case, and derive which areas might be prone to flooding. I combined, for example, the data from um, NASA about the heavy precip precipitations to see which drainage basin uh, is prone to flooding. In this case here, we have high precipitations. Uh, so we, I know this area will not be prone to flooding, only this drainage basin. And then I can give um, um, people are able to warn, uh, for example, people which areas might be prone to flooding. And I think this is a very important tool. Um, and then the next step, uh, what I've mentioned, the documentation of uh, past flooding events to uh, document uh, dry seasons, wet seasons, which areas are flooded, and uh, to answer the question. Are there changes? Are there more areas flooded? Are there more intense precipitations? And we must be aware of the sea level rise um, as, because also um, because of the seawater intrusion. Seawater is, um, yeah, you know, this um, the intrusion of uh, saline water into freshwater aquifers in coastal areas. And uh, this will um, uh, yeah, influence the potential to use agriculture. Uh, so this monitoring is very important to have on a regular basis um, the documentation of uh, flooding events. And then uh, to extract from the flooded areas from the satellite images exactly which areas are flooded and then combine this information of the flooded areas in the past with the situation of buildings, of roads, for example, to see which areas uh, might be prone in, to flooding in future again. And this is important to know for the city planners, please don't uh, plan uh, buildings and uh, urban areas in this area, but of course they know already, but you know uh, with 
to with the uh, to expected with the expected sea level rise more areas might be flooded and then even these buildings in Surabaya might be prone to flooding and this is something something we have to be aware of here on the upper left you see an original radar image sentinel one image i have a color coded to see better the flooded area here you see a sentinel two image uh, of flooded areas. And then I had a look at the digital elevation data. I created a contour line in red um, about the areas below 10 meter height level. And you see already now uh, all the areas below 10 meters have been flooded in the past already. And now imagine 15 meter in the worst case scenario, of course, um, um, more areas will be flooded in the future and lost for agriculture, for settlements, for urban planning, and so on. So what every community uh, must have, I dare to say, have a map with buildings, um, to create maps with buildings below five meter height level, to be aware that they might be prone to flooding in the future. This is a possibility. So we have to create such map uh, here again, in a other scale, we have to look at the waterways uh, because near the waterways, the flooding will be uh, faster. And again, to digitize all the buildings, extract the buildings uh, below five meter height level. And this is important. For example, there are schools in areas that might be in future will be flooded. You have to, yeah, think about uh, how to plan schools in safe areas that are not prone to flooding. So this is just an example how to use uh, these data for uh, the yeah, flooding resilience. And another point is uh, important for the future. Uh, there are a lot of bridges in Indonesia, um, high tech bridges, very expensive. But what happens with sea level rise? Um, you see uh, this bridge already influences the streaming pattern, but imagine 50 meter higher, what will this mean for the infrastructure uh, in future? So there are a lot of questions for the future that you have to think about. Uh, I was asked to have some thoughts about the area of uh, Borneo, of Kalimantan. Um, again, I... Uh, switch now to the uh, drainage basins in Kalimantan area. And uh, I merged this uh, drainage delineation map with the height levels below 10 meter, below 15 meter to see what uh, can we plan for the futures, which areas uh, you must be careful to plan because they are lowlands. So uh, I think this is uh, something every student can do uh, in, in a GIS course. But uh, what is a little bit more complicated, it's not enough just to calculate a drainage basin. We must know more about the hydro uh, geology as well uh, to be on the safe side uh, when to know which areas might be flooded. And, uh, considering as well the question of environmental pollution, because there might be fault zones, there might be um, lithologic conditions um, uh, that in the underground, so that the morphological watershed here, the green line, is now identical with the hydrogeologic uh, situation, because fault zones are more um, permeable, there's a higher permeability for water flow. So uh, it is uh, important to include the geology because of this, the mining industry. Um, I think um, just having you get this geologic map as well, free of charge, just look at the um, one geology portal, you get um, first maps without costs again. So um, most of the geological survey, they sell their geologic maps and often you have to buy with, to get a higher resolution. But the first information every community can get from without costs, just using these services. So um, just to give you an idea in Kalimantan, what uh, mining industry, the coal mining industry, um, 
yeah, you see traces of it on the surface of the Kalimantan. Uh, a lot of lakes and water of ponds uh, are created uh, because the extracted material uh, remains empty and then is filled with water and so on. So uh, just look at the area. It's like a you know, sea surf landscape. So um, what uh, it is, this industry, for example, agriculture, mining, quarrying is the most of the weather and climate dependent economic sector of Indonesia. And we must be aware that increasing amount of extreme weather events due to climate change uh, causing flash floods might have an impact on these mining sites. Just to show you the intensity of the land use by coal mining and other mining industry, uh, again, it is important uh, when you're dealing with hydrology, with water management, to have an exact idea about the water surfaces and how this industry might influence groundwater flow. Because of course, the ground flow, water, groundwater flow is influenced by the mining industry. And uh, we can derive and extract this information of water surfaces, as I've said already, uh, precisely from the radar images. And uh, we can make a continuously monitoring of the surface water development. Uh, and this would contribute to, as well to economic loss prevention. And here, what might be what might happen again if these mining sites are too close to the sea sites, they might be influenced by sea level rise. So um, I think uh, until 2300, these mining sites are e exploited and uh, maybe don't exist anymore. But there are many mining sectors. Um, where remains environmental pollution, for example, the gold industry. So you have to think about what happens when there's sea level rise and uh, changing groundwater conditions, rise of groundwater, groundwater levels uh, about the possibility of environmental pollution. So this is an, a very important thing to monitor these areas and to see the influence of climate change on this environment. This is one aspect. Another aspect to use remote sensing data is uh, when we are dealing with climate change, that the sediment flow is of course changing. When we have more extreme weather events, um, then there is a lot of sediment load. Uh, and this can be monitored very good with the help of remote sensing data. Uh, but I think we, it's very useful to combine this information with bathymetric data to understand better. For example, here is the shelf area, and then we have a deep uh, drop, H drop here to deeper areas in the sea. And for this reason, this sediment flow here, this area stops so abrupt. So we have to combine a lot of information, and re it requires, of course, a lot of background a lot of, I say, GIS in your heads uh, to combine this data that it makes sense. And uh, just to be aware that uh, there is a lot of city planning or urban planning in Indonesia, you see now why it is so important um, to have a very careful database for planning purposes. So what we can do with just using the digital elevation data uh, and what every flooding prone community uh, can do to get maps uh, to pre uh, indicate precisely which areas are most likely to be affected. And thus these maps can be created just using the digital free available digital elevation data by just extracting data information, for example, where are uh, the lowest, highest uh, heat levels that are prone to flooding. Where are the lowest slope degrees? Where is the curvature of the terrain equal zero? Where are the flattest areas? And so on. And then we uh, use the uh, weighted overlay. We aggregate and summarize these factors that we extract from the heat level data and uh, morphometric maps. 
And then we put this together in the weighted overlay approach and we get a very good overview here in dark blue areas, um, dark blue colors, the areas that are most likely to be flooded in case of extreme weather events or in case of sea level rise. So I think this map is a basic map. Whatever happens, it shows us just where is the susceptibility to flooding highest because of these morphometric factors. Just to repeat, I have a slope gradient map derived from the uh, height data and uh, extracted the slope gradients, the lowest from the height level, the lowest areas, the curvature equal to zero, and so on, and I created a weighted overlay aggregating the factors in the weighted overlay approach here in ArcGIS to create such maps. And it works. When you combine the, for example, the documentation of past flooding here on the radar image, we know now the black areas are the water surfaces. And you compare this with the weighted overlay approach, then you see exactly these areas are flooded that appear dark blue on the weighted overlay map. So I think every community should have such a map to be prepared and to know. Another important question is the tsunami hazard preparedness. How does uh, uh, climate change, especially sea level rise, affect the tsunami hazard preparedness in Indonesia? And I think it's a very important um, question because uh, we know the sea level rise has also consequences for tsunami hazard preparedness. So the sea level rise will lead to more affected areas in case of severe tsunami events such as in 2004. And by evaluating the satellite images of the tsunami event in 2004, it was documented in Sumatra that the areas below 10 to 20 meters were flooded. The 10 and 20 meter height level contour line comprised nearly exactly the flooded areas. So in case of sea level rise of several meters, the tsunami hazard preparedness has to be adapted. And tsunami warning has to be extended to larger areas, especially in, flat, in a flat environment. Just to show you what I mean, here you see satellite images on the area in Sumatra from uh, 2001 before the tsunami event in 2004, and you see in green the areas that have been flooded in 2004 exactly. And we can derive from this that tsunami events like in 2004 have been happened, have happened in the past. And we know this from ge geophysical reports as well, they are documented. And we can expect that this might happen in future again. Uh, so again, this area is exactly corresponds to the 20 meter contour line. So the question arises, how sea level rise will affect extreme tsunami events like in 2004? Can it be assumed that in even larger uh, areas, that larger areas will be flooded? And th in this case, the communities in these areas should be prepared. Uh, what we, there's an urgent need that tsunami modeling uh, considers sea level rise uh, and uh, this uh, should be carried out, this modeling for different scenarios. Just I added here the 30 meter contour line. It doesn't look so dangerous in this area. You think it's a small area, but uh, when you have a flat area, it makes a difference. Again, here 2001, this area has been flooded before because it is, is exactly the area that has been flooded and even more area has been flooded in 2004. So uh, what we can expect from flat areas, for example, here in Banda Aceh, okay. that even uh, a larger area might be flooded if such a tsunami like in 2004 happens again. And I think uh, people should be aware of this uh, potential scenario to be warned. Another uh, area that might be prone to tsunami uh, is maybe the Strait of Madura. Tsunamis have been documented and severe earthquakes and uh, volcanic eruptions. So uh, there are a lot of uh, potentials 
um, of uh, yeah, high energetic waves. Uh, there is a potential of sage, there is a, a potential of earthquakes, uh, volcanic uh, collapse, submarine landslides, meteor tsunamis, strong tidal waves. I give you an example in the following slides. And uh, so it is important to combine, of course, the satellite data with meteorological data, with wind data, with uh, uh, water current information. But what you can see on this image is, for example, a wave front, a very uh, expressed and uh, clearly visible wave front. I suppose these are strong tidal waves because there is no uh, tsunami event documented at the time of acquisition time of the uh, Landsat image. Um, so um, I, you see, have a look here, these small white points are ships. So it is uh, really, I think, an important aspect to monitor carefully water currents, to monitor freak waves, to monitor wave fronts. Uh, I think it's an aspect uh, as well for the um, fishery industry for the marine traffic as well. And what we can do with satellite images, uh, seasonal, seasonal monitoring, monitoring with different wind conditions, how the water currents interact with wind and how they interact with the morphology of the coast. For example, if there is a south wind or if there is a west wind, east wind, every time there is a different current pattern in this flat, relatively flat uh, sea. So I think this is a very important aspect that there is a interaction with the coastal morphology, with tidal waves. So we have to take this into consideration. Just as I have mentioned, marine, uh, marine traffic is an important part of the Indonesian economy. And thus the monitoring of water currents and the streaming pattern is certainly a very useful contribution uh, for the future. So just to summarize some of uh, my presentation to the aspects, what will uh, climate change and uh, uh, will be for Indonesia and what are the consequences for the coastal areas? Uh, there's first of all land loss due to flooding. Seasonal flooding, we can assume and see already, will intensify and more areas will be affected. Extreme weather events will increase combined with heavy precipitation and flash floods. Sea level rise will intensify land erosion and landslides along the coasts. This is something this will intensify and there will be land loss as well due to landslides and rockfall. And then in case of extreme tsunami events, the flooded areas will probably enlarge because of the sea level rise. Another aspect is environmental pollution. Um, the uh, potential of environmental pollution due to flooding of coast near industrial plants and sewage system is augmenting. And of course, it has to be mentioned economic loss related to the loss of buildings and infrastructure. So what will be the conclusions? Um, what I've said already, flooding hazard resilience requires an interdisciplinary approach and strong cooperation and data exchange between different disciplines and institutions. One of the tasks to strengthen disaster, flooding disaster, general disaster resilience should be improving the interdisciplinary knowledge transfer, cooperations and alignments between disaster involved institutions and what is important too, to provide the legal and technical infrastructure. The equipment is one important aspect. And the next, the GIS integrated evaluation of the different data sets helps to identify areas vulnerable to flooding. And the free available data and software could be used in every community provided the training of the staff is given. And using these tools, strategies for flooding management adapt and adapt adapted to the no local needs uh, and integrated integrating uh, local knowledge 
can be elaborated and actualized continuously. Yeah, it is finally very urgent to combine the knowledge of the flooding hazards with the efforts of urban and regional planning and social sciences. Urban and regional planning has to adapt more and more to the impacts of climate change. And as I've said already, the exchange of data between different institutions often needs the support of laws and the control of laws. So I come to the end of my presentation. And I thank you very much for your invitation. Rima Kazi, thank you very much for your intention. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Baratara. Uh, maybe you can also uh, give us or provide us some example by using the software of SNAP and how to uh, work with the software to uh, Utilize yeah. The, yeah. So I, uh, you start a snap, please, for the participants on your laptop. Wait a minute, I go to snap. So uh, maybe um, I uh, start with uh, what do you wish uh, first, radar image or Sentinel 2 optical data? I um, think. The Sentinel 2, maybe. Ah, good. You have uh, one image um, I have uploaded into the Dropbox. Maybe you have uploaded uh, it somewhere. If not, I demonstrate just how to open. I've downloaded from the US Geological Survey the um, image uh, and just, yeah, I go to File, Open Product, and then to the uh, image file and then I say I have uh, sent an, uh, uh, how to say uh, a way to a description how to manage the data you'll find a PDF file in the guest lectures um, file I've sent to you to Sari so uh, if you have questions uh, and I, the procedure is too fast I uh, you can use the description I've sent in the PDF file so now you open the uh, XML document to get the file here on the left side. I close this and then I open here on the left side in the table of content uh, the bands. You see there are a lot of bands corresponding to a certain spectral spectrum. Uh, infrared, red and so on. And uh, especially these bands are uh, very susceptible to sensitive to water surfaces. So I close this. Then I go here to the head and right click, right click, and say open RGB image window. So now appears uh, automatically a band combination um, that fits. What you have to know, I open uh, the, uh, wait a minute. You have to know that uh, the bands have a different special resolution. Uh, some are these two, three, four have the special resolution of 10 meters and five, six, seven, seven have the special resolution of 20 meter and so on. So you can combine in a RGB image only um, those bands with the same special resolution, open RGB. And this is, for example, here. And I want to have, um, for example, include here the band eight. The band eight has the several same special resolution of 10 meter and say, okay. So here you have the area of Semarang. And you have the image of a um, uh, flooded season, of the humid season, uh, rock season, season, and in dark blue appear the areas that are flooded. And uh, you see um, it must have rained before because there is a strong sediment flow towards the sea. So what you can do in the left side, you go to the navigation window here, navigation, and 
you can move here the, the arrow below, you see, to look more into the detail. Take some time, you can move it around the image. And the next step is, I think uh, we can enhance build the visibility. You go uh, here to the color manipulation tool. And here you can manipulate the um, different colors. For example, you go to red, uh, I'll give me a red, it's more red now. Oh, I want now more blue to see better this surf water surfaces now. I think this is better uh, to increase just the visibility. Then uh, I want to have it in darker or yeah, colors, for example. I go again here, color manipulation. Uh, just to show here, you see the button, more options on the upper uh, lower left. I hope you find it. If I'm too quick, please tell me. Sorry, you tell me. Uh, okay. Then, so you have it, more options. And now you can choose, you can manipulate the histogram of the colors. Or you can hear what I want to do now, because I want to uh, change the dark or lighter tones. Uh, I want it darker now. I move the brightness, you see. So then I want to have more contrast. No, it's not so good. You have to experiment and to try a little bit. And uh, whatever manipulation or of processing you do, it depends on the purpose of your research or your investigation. So here I want to change the saturation. Uh, close this, sorry. And uh, then manipulate this. So uh, this is the most important thing. It is done quickly. And when I'm content with my image, I go back here a little bit. I can close this again, go back and make it more blue. So it's better. So when you are happy with your image processing, you go to the right, uh, into the image, right click, export view as image here. Export view as image uh, to be able to integrate um, this uh, image, the Sentinel-2 image, into your GIS, you don't need PNG. You need, you open the button here, you need GeoTIFF location, because here it's georeferenced. And um, this you can integrate in your QGIS, ArcGIS, whatever you want. So this is important. You remind the format to export. But if you chose GeoTIFF, you have to click Full C, otherwise it doesn't work. You will see when you try another, um, maybe here, BMP, uh, for example, and you want to export uh, U region, you can, but BMP has no coordinates. There is uh, no use to, if you integrate this into your GIS, you cannot merge, you cannot merge it with, with shape files of roads of otherwise. So you choose, please remind GeoTIFF and then full C and then say save. If the folder were to save and this uh, yeah, takes some time. But now uh, we can try other combinations as you try what you want. I shouldn't have done this, but it's difficult to stop when you started. So um, just to show this, you can start another end combination. I yeah, it takes some time to save this. Uh, and then you can integrate this image immediately into your UGIS. And uh, you open again, a uh, right click RGB image window and try dance with the same special resolution, maybe four, six. Seven, five, six, seven, sorry, five, six, seven with 20 meter resolution. This image has a resolu special resolution of 10 meter, but I'm exporting. Uh, I didn't think, sorry, to, uh, I didn't want to waste time. 
These are the basics you have to know when you open Sentinel and work with Sentinel data just to work uh, to the first steps of digital image processing. But of course, there are very good tutorials to learn about more steps, uh, how to look at the image uh, or to create sub scenes. Uh, if you want only have a small scene, uh, you can create a special sub scene. I cannot stop now my exporting of the image, but um, it will stop, I think, in a minute. So um, you see, you can in, in, see in dark blue the flooded areas immediately and have a good data base for the buildings you see as white spots and the streets to see which buildings are safe or which buildings might be flooded or might be flooded in future. Here you see the flooded areas with, with white spots. Uh, these um, buildings, I think they will have to be, uh, they will give up in future. They will be lost in future due to sea level rise. So you can um, combine these uh, Sentinel-2 images with your digital terrain data, if you have, as you have seen uh, in my presentation. And this is a very good database. And this software is uh, easy to handle. And I think, uh, quick to learn and worth uh, to distribute um, to the people. They, I think even if you have not good internet connection in smaller communities, you have your handy, you con can connect via hotspot with your handy. And you can connect your laptop if there is no internet available, but via handy, a smartphone or whatever, you can connect to internet and download this uh, information easily. So um, this is something I think in Indonesia, everybody now has a, a handy and connection to the web. And this is a good tool to create a data bank for your purpose. So I can't stop it, sorry. So um, are there questions to this so far? Ah, finally. So, um, yeah. okay, maybe while we're waiting, maybe uh, for the student, maybe you have a question so far. So just, no. everybody is overwhelmed by the amount of information. <laughs> So you see here, this is what I mean. This area is flooded and this will be, I think, lost in the future with increasing sea level rise. And if you create uh, with the available digital innovation data contour lines, you will see exactly these areas which will be uh, prone to flooding in future and these areas will be lost in future. I'm sorry to say, but I'm quite sure even if there are only maybe two meter or three meters and not the worst case scenario uh, of 15 meters, but uh, more land will be lost. You can see here the ancient coastlines still that are lost already. So um, what I wanted to say, you can create uh, not only the whole image, you can create a special subset from the view. If you want only this area, uh, you extract this area. Take some time again. Substantial subset. So please carry on. Uh, to create a special subset is very important when you are working with uh, radar data because um, I said already I can switch now to the radar image. Um, here I have loaded one. And when I open the radar image, you, you find the detailed description in your uh, PDF files, intensity file. Somehow. And uh, in the description is uh, explained what means how uh, vertical horizontal polarization of the um, uh, radar signals. It takes some time just to load the image because of uh, one gigabyte size of the image. And I have an old laptop, it takes some time. 
But uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, you cannot load this radar image into QGIS as a whole. You see, it is site inverted, the original data. Now you have to do image processing to gain a correct map. But we know now already, uh, if you look, the black areas take some time until the image is built. These are the flooded areas because of the uh, reflection of the radar signals from uh, mirror-like away from the anten radar antenna. And therefore, we get these black uh, uh, tones, gray tones, and dark gray tones and black areas. These are water surfaces. But uh, to get uh, just a short overview, uh, you want to have this area to create a special subset. I hope it works now. Now it works. Okay. Because this is important. Uh, if, if you um, work, take uh, on with the uh, next steps of calibration and geometric correction to invert the image, um, it takes nearly two hours if you have an old laptop because of the data amount. So I create a special subset to be able to use this subset. You see in blue lines, the subset, to be able to integrate this in my QGIS uh, map later. And then as I say now, oh, okay. And then if this appears here, again, you open in the table of content, the left side, look at the bands, open, intensity for each. Now a new image worked. Now we have only this image. You see, we can zoom again into the image. And now we continue with the next steps. So I lower it a little. The next step is the ray to use the radar tool. Radiometric calibration. You have to understand why uh, radar signals are not like in um, optical image, just a gray tone because of the spectral reflection. Uh, a radar signal is a measure. Uh, it is a control signal by the satellite, emitted by the satellite, and uh, the back, backscatter, the reflection of this radar signal is uh, measured. And you need some um, certain points on the surface uh, to calibrate uh, the radar signal. And uh, this is important that you have the same uh, yeah, uh, setting of the radar image. It's a little bit uh, now different, difficult to explain with few words, but it's a very important step. And I say one. Oh. Sorry. Okay, nothing is without problem. Polarization and take no age. Run. Okay, try again. No, I have a problem now. File again. Two parameters. So nothing is without problems. I say here. Simarangsi, give a name. No, not Lotus was error. So it's always the first time I want to calibrate again. Radar, radiometric, calibrate. And directory, open, snap, run. Try again. If there's an error, sorry, it happens sometimes. Uh, it never happens before, but when I want to demonstrate, of course, it happens. But uh, what I say, you have now the sub scene. You can continue. I try now the next step without calibration, just to show what is very uh, important. Uh, because we want we want the real scene, not the side inverted terrain correction, range Doppler terrain correction. This is the next step. When you ah, what I forgot. This is the problem. So I have to underline in in blue. So I try again. Sorry. So let's try again. One. 
again, sorry. This is, sorry. The next step will be probably difficult again. Geometric terrain correction, range doubler terrain correction. So open snap one. Let's see what happens. Again, at error. I think, um, oh, I forgot, I know the error now. The source. I didn't switch on my external device to give the path. This is what the error. This is demonstration. <laughs> so I have to wait in a moment. But these are the main steps you have to do the radiometric uh, calibration. Again, run. No, I must work again. Not, sorry. So these are uh, the steps that are important. First, to create a special subscene, and then to make a geometric uh, correction. Uh, and uh, this happens by combining the radar data with SRTM data, with the height. Because often in radar data, we have the problem of uh, distortions. And so for this reason, um, the radar images were combined with SRTM digital elevation data to make a geometric correction. And uh, then uh, the product is, uh, the final product is then like this, that you have a larger special resolution, but nevertheless, um, you can include it without problems when it works. Uh, this was my error. Uh, the path to the uh, folder didn't work before. So um, this helps to uh, make a geo calibrated and geometric corrected image after this, and then you can work in uh, ArcGIS, extract the water surfaces and combine this with roads and buildings and so on. So I think this was a short demonstration. Sorry that it isn't, didn't work now because of my error, I have to finish a snap and start again and load the data again to give the software the right path for the saving the image and for the procedure. So I think I finished this short introduction into SNAP. Um, I think it's worth, uh, here are a lot of more tools for radar. Uh, you, what, what is very important um, and but difficult uh, to uh, learn is interferometry, to work with different radar data, to get an idea where is subsidence and how fast the subsidence is ongoing. So you can use this as well. Uh, this is very important to learn this tool for Indonesia, but I think it's a special session. And until now, uh, sorry, but I have not the capacity to learn this until yet. It's very complicated. You need more back, radar background uh, knowledge. But to use this data, uh, just uh, get an introduction, learn how to monitor the water surfaces for the beginners. Is, uh, first be sufficient, I think. So I think uh, I stop here and I thank you for the attention. And now I'm waiting for your questions, if you have. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Barbara for the presentation and for giving us some demonstration. And with that, we can open up a discussion session for a few questions. Participants are very welcome to ask questions if you want to ask questions, you can raise your hand and turn your mic and camera on, or also write down the questions on the chat box. Okay, me, maybe. <laughs> Hello, okay. Prof. Prabara. Uh, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah. I remember with me, I'm Sudaryatno from uh, Faculty of Geography. Uh, we uh, met about maybe uh, on uh, 2017, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, I am one of a uh, team teaching a uh, lecture of uh, remote sensing uh, for hydrology and uh, water set in uh, my department. <clears throat> uh, maybe uh, please explain uh, 
how identified yeah, how identified uh, different of uh, Indonesian flood uh, and uh, class flood. Uh, maybe there are uh, type of uh, flood uh, like uh, Indonesian and uh, class flood. Uh, maybe you uh, uh, could uh, explain uh, the different uh, uh, about uh, this, uh, please. Yeah, I'm from Germany, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have to learn myself because I don't live in Indonesia. So I have to study the literature and the satellite images. And then there ends my competence, you know, you have more than I. But uh, what I've learned from the satellite images to monitor the difference between extreme weather events, for mm -hmm. example, Cyclone Dahlia, uh, I've seen myself the consequences in uh, 2017. I was there at that time. And uh, then the next step, the seasonal flooding that happens regularly, but uh, will increase. The area affected will uh, increase because of sea level rise. And finally, the tsunami flooding because of uh, storm surge, uh, meteor tsunamis because of extreme pressure differences in the atmosphere. There are local meteor tsunamis, uh, there is more storm surge, there are ex high energetic uh, flood waves. So this, for me, are the main differences I have seen from my evaluations. Maybe you can correct me. Okay, uh, the flash flood, like uh, suddenly flood, uh, because uh, there are uh, 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 maximum of uh, inter, uh, maximum of uh, precip precipitation like uh, uh, more than uh, 100 uh, millimeters in one hour yeah and the inundation flood uh, like uh, flood uh, uh, location in the uh, alluvial uh, plain yeah maybe yeah or uh, in uh, <coughs> So uh, maybe uh, there are different uh, type of flood there, yeah, yeah. Uh, like uh, Indonesian flood, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the area in the uh, downstream, down yeah, in the downstream, yeah. and and uh, maybe uh, the flash flood uh, lo located in uh, upper stream, uh, there are uh, different uh, uh, relief, yeah. So uh, in Indonesia, uh, there are uh, some uh, flood likes uh, this uh, flood like uh, Indonesia and plus flood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sudaryatno, for the question. Is there any other question that participants want to ask? Because if there are no participants that asking question. I want to ask a question to Professor Werber. Uh, is there any other uh, open source software or free software that we can use to do flood hazard assessment? Because uh, one of which is maybe Google Earth Engine, maybe. Because from yeah. what I know, Google Earth Engine is a powerful tool to do uh, remote sensing and GIS data processing. Can we use that to do flood hazard assessment, Professor? Um, I'm sure it is possible, but I didn't work myself with this. Uh, I tried, but uh, usually uh, I use these tools I've learned already, you know, and um, of course it's a poss good possibility to work with this tool. But uh, I think um, uh, the theme of the uh, presentation was to uh, how we can get the information to uh, the affected communities. And we have to think that these people are people of administration often in the, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, they are not trained in geographic sciences or in hydrology. So if you recommend uh, software or tools, you must remain, you must be aware that they need first training. And for Google, uh, uh, for, yeah, for this Google engine, um, you must have 
uh, background knowledge you must uh, learn again of course it's a good tool uh, but uh, you must decide um, what where to start what where i do begin uh, will i train them with um, cool dis uh, and then maybe uh, with uh, snap is it too complicated you have to test uh, what uh, will be most successful uh, it depends on the training stuff. Uh, if you go, for example, into the communities that are affected by flooding, and you see uh, they work better with Google Engine, um, then uh, you try this. So it depends on the people, on the stuff, on the willingness, on the interests. So we have to try, I think. It's possible, of course. OK, great. Thank you for the answer, Professor. Is there any other questions from the participants? If participants want to ask questions, you can type down some last minute questions if you want, and we'll stick around for a few more minutes. We can do it like this. You give them my email address and they can write me the questions and I answer complete and uh, with more effort and more time, if you wish. Just an idea, just an idea. Maybe please, uh, Mr. Garinsa, uh, as uh, for <coughs> Prof. Brabara. Silahkan, Mas Garinsa. <laughs> hey, thank you, Mr. Sudaryatno. Uh, there is a question from my friend that asked in the chat box. She asked that as the water quality of the land can be estimated using satellite imagery, is it possible to monitor the quality of the tsunami's water that will affect the land in in correlation with water quality of land, Professor? What we can do with remote sensing pools is uh, to estimate the sediment load for the first centimeters. Um, but uh, this is limited because uh, even um, if you uh, use thermal images for this purpose, you get only the first upper centimeters of the water body of the sea and you get the streaming pattern, you get the return flow, but the water quality, uh, this is a very uh, important, uh, very and very important aspect because in many coastal areas don't have uh, or have environmental pollution, oil industry or sewage that is not working or anymore or doesn't exist at all. Uh, and uh, when a tsunami happens and high energetic tsunami waves come to the coast, um, of course there is a amount of environmental pollution, but this is not possible. With remote sensing, we can only estimate sediment load for the upper first centimeters of the water surface. Thank you for the answer, Mr. Professor Berber. But what we can see on the satellite images, for example, if there is a, a, a oil pollution, for example, this is very good to see on the water surface. Or if there is a certain point of uh, environmental pollution, um, uh, this is uh, distributed at the surface, then you can monitor this very good. But uh, it's limited, this pool. Great, thank you, Professor. If any of you want to ask questions, you can raise your hand, turn your mic, or also write the question on the chat box. Uh, Mas Garinsa, mungkin teman-teman uh, dari tim tsunami bisa bertanya ini ya untuk run up ya. Uh, ini ada Baik. juga. Ini, ini. Monggo. Ini pertanyaan yang sudah ditanyakan tadi, Pak. Dari okay. Mbak Putri tadi. Uh, mungkin untuk yang ini yang tim uh, tsunami ya, yang untuk run up itu bisa ditanyakan juga tentang ke, ke video ya. Yeah. Uh, your question is uh, how 
to estimate the run up of the tsunami waves. Yes, to... yes, and maybe uh, Prof. Raba uh, can explain about the run up of tsunami uh, uh, time by time, maybe uh, by real time. Yeah, can uh, use uh, satellite and uh, the others. Please. Yeah. Um, it depends on the origin of the tsunami source. Uh, you know very well uh, the earthquake, if it's a nearby earthquake with a lot of uh, displacement, then it's you have minutes to predict like in 2004, uh, a short time. Uh, and um, it's very difficult to predict the run up if you, it's depending on the source and the uh, travel time of the tsunami waves and the intensity and the direction, many factors play an important role. Then the morphology of the coast, if you have a cliff, uh, there are other conditions for run up um, than in a flat environment. What we have to be aware of that in flat environments, the effects of climate change and sea level rise, especially, I mean, now sea level rise, that will be notable. If you have a similar tsunami like in Sumatra in this area, a larger area will be affected when the sea level rise is higher. But how far this has to be done, this work from tsunami modelers uh, and to calculate this and inclusive the uh, geomorphology conditions, the um, uh, slope degree, the height level, all these factors have to be integrated. The intensity of the tsunami wave. So it's very difficult to predict this. What we can do, what I've shown in remote sensing, to be aware what happened in the past. This was the, the fact that the flooded areas were exactly uh, um, covered by the contour line of 20 meter height level. So uh, this is a fact. And what we can add to this is when the sea level rise is in a worst case scenario, 15 meters, we have to add some um, yeah, vulnerability to the flat areas, to more areas affected by flooding in case of a severe tsunami. This is now we cannot do with the tools of remote sensing and GIS. Okay, maybe uh, Prof. Barbara have an uh, example or uh, you, you uh, practice about the uh, uh, tsunami uh, in Indonesia? No. Not that yet. Yeah. No, okay. I hope not. I hope not. But in Germany, we have severe flash floods as well now. As well, we had catastrophic flash floods now as well. And people become more and more aware of the situation and to change the uh, energ energetic um, use. And uh, yeah, I think things are changing a lot due to the war in Europe as well. We fear now a lot, of, uh, a lot of people fear the war now. I think there are many bad things in the world. Okay. Okay, thank you, Professor Barbara and Mr. Sudariyatno. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, because if there is no questions, maybe Professor Barbara can give us two questions to the participants. And then if the participants want to answer the questions, you can raise your hands and then answer the question directly by uh, turning on your microphone. Uh, it's difficult to give questions to people I can see. <laughs> But, uh, I think I, I will. I will add to Garenza. My apology. I jump in. Uh, Professor Barbara, we have door prize here. We have two door prize, and uh, the door prize is the dedicated to a student who are able to answer a question. Just uh, provide just very easy question in uh, that pass on your mind, and uh, maybe about the satellite, about the process itself, the thing that you remember. Uh, that uh, what is it? Uh, content in your uh, presentation. So you have just want to make sure, uh, just want to check whether they listen carefully to your presentation or not. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. who it? Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Ari Tahyano have some question. 
Ya, Mari. ini <laughs> ya, still, uh, kami sedang meminta Prof. Barbara untuk memberikan pertanyaan yeah. kepada mahasiswa. Yeah. Dua pertanyaan bagi yeah. mahasiswa yang bisa menjawab, maybe oh, not two, okay. only one. <laughs> bagi mahasiswa yang bisa menjawab pertanyaan dengan benar, maka akan ada door prize dari tim pengajar PJ Hidro. Ya, yeah. please, yeah. Profesor. It's less a question, but a hope. I hope that many students of your department dealing with flooding hazard assessment, with hydrology, that they uh, are trained later, are going as a trainer to the affected communities and distribute their knowledge to the people um, so they can profit from your knowledge the most. And they are better prepared for what is coming in the future because this is a real challenge, what I see. But I think uh, that uh, human mankind is inventive and has adapted always uh, the new circumstances in life. So I'm really confident that there are solutions for the future. And I hope uh, that your students uh, will be part of this training people help to distribute in schools, in departments, or in training centers uh, to distribute your knowledge. All right. Well, thank you so much, Prof. Barbara. If you don't have any question, am I allowed to provide one question to my student? So you will uh, you, you will judge whether the uh, answer is correct or not. All right. The question from me is, please mention the countries that have been uh, I mean, the countries where uh, Professor Barbara Reset has been implemented. Oh, Professor Barbara, yep, uh, yeah, Professor Barbara already present uh, present a lot of country uh, on their on her presentation. Please mention at least two countries or two area two area that Professor Barbara mentioned in her presentation today. Sebutkan negara atau area yang disebut oleh Profesor Barbara di presentasi Prof. Barbara tadi. Yang benar jawabannya akan mendapat door prize. Ini kayaknya ini pada merhatiin nggak ya Mbak Sari ya? Terutama ini yang Mas Pak dari KPC dan dari UMS ini banyak. Iya, silakan dari ya. UMS dan dari KPC. Iya. Ya, Pak Jumadi, anu ya. Jadi ada pesan dari Pak Jumadi, uh, mm -hmm. beliau menugaskan seluruh mahasiswanya untuk kuliah dan silakan All untuk right. bertanya atau menjawab ini. Ya. All right. Okay, now please raise hand. Uh, please raise hand and uh, uh, you please open your microphone. Two countries, not one. Haikal, is it Haikal or um, Akmal, 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 would you please open your camera and microphone to answer the question? Uh, Fabriana. Yes. Oh, Fabriana, okay, Fabriana first. All right, Fabriana, would you please to open your, well, okay, we will see Akmal and Fabriana. Fabriana first. Semarang and Kalimantan. Semarang and Kalimantan, all right. Um, Akmal? You, you're not allowed to copy Fabriana answer. Uh, sorry, but I guess the question is about the country, right, ma'am? Yes, the country and area. I, I, oh. I ask country or area. Uh, yes, the question is Surabaya and Kalimantan. Kalimantan, all right. <laughs> whether whether uh, their answer correct from Barbara? Zimarang <laughs> as well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, congratulations. <laughs> Terima kasih Akmal and uh, Fabriana. Your answer are absolutely correct. And you can contact, um, well, you can contact me later to ask me about the door price. I'm not, I have no idea yet what is the door price, but I will think about that after this. But uh, thank you so much for participating on this uh, door price session. <laughs> All right, I written uh, the session to Garenza. Uh, yeah, Garenza, silakan. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wiwit, Miss Wiwit. I'm sorry. Langsung ditutup aja. Or... Kalau Pak Pak Yatno atau Mbak Sari tidak ada tambahan. Baik. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Wiwit, for the questions to us. Okay, because there are no more questions were asked, maybe we can end this public lecture.
I think we already have enough questions and discussions for this public lecture. Thanks a lot, Professor Barbara, for being the main speaker. We really appreciate your time and we hope to meet you again next time. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Prof. Barbara. Uh, Untuk foto for, bersama uh, dulu. Oh, yes, uh, we, oh, yeah, yeah. we already have a pictures, but we can start it again. We can we can start again. Uh, I ask all the students to provide a moticon for Professor Barbara, or you can open mic to just give a clap sound for her <laughs> to express your gratitude and appreciation for her time to share her knowledge with us. Thank you. Garansa, silahkan dipimpin foto dulu. Habis itu kita... Yeah. Baik. Uh, silahkan teman-teman untuk mengaktifkan kamera untuk mengikuti sesi foto bersama sebelum kita mengakhiri kuliah umum pada siang hari ini. Silahkan teman, -teman. Mas, jadi mungkin tidak dipin, mungkin dibuka, di-share yang bisa lihat semua peserta. Yeah, we still we still want to capture some uh, screen, a uh, catch up screen with you on it, Prof. Barbara. I'm sorry, we still doesn't want you to go yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh. All right. Okay. Three, two, one. Smile, Akila, Mas Erdan. Oh, yeah. All right. Pak Yatna. Oh, yeah. Smile. Smile and smile. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I think this is the end of the class today and the lecture today. Again, thank you so much, Professor Barbara. Uh, again, we cannot uh, like provide any, uh, or we cannot pay anything back for yeah, your okay. effort. And um, we we really expect that you will uh, join with us again. Like this is not the last time you will join. We will invite you, and I hope you don't mind with that. And we're looking forward again for you to share another knowledge with us. Thank you so much, and have a nice day. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Prof. Barbara. Next to you. Thank you. Sari, Matron, Ibu Sari yang sudah berkomunikasi. Garensa, terima kasih. Terima kasih juga, Bu Wiwit. Ya, makasih. Akmal sama Ibu Biana ditagi ya. Kalau nggak ditagi, saya lupa nih. Bentar. Thank you. All right. See you, everyone.